will be given by uh, Simon Eberts from uh, Oxford University, and it's about broken-hearted how to attack ECG, ECG biometric systems. So, Simon? Okay, let me... Uh, can I get my... Ah, ooh, too soon. Okay, there we go. Hi, my name is Simon, and I'm here today to talk about our work on how to attack ECG biometrics. So before we get into this, let me give you a quick background of what ECG is. So ECG is short for electrocardiography, and it's essentially a medical diagnosis technique. So the human heart is stimulated by electrical impulses, and these impulses can then be measured on the surface of a person's skin. And ECG is simply the voltage potential between two electrodes attached to a person's body uh, plotted over time. So this is what a normal ECG measurement looks like when it's done in a hospital. So we can see a patient, and that patient has a number of electrodes attached to their body. And ECG is then always the voltage difference between two electrodes. So it's always measured between a pair of electrodes. And as I said, most commonly, this is used in a hospital for diagnosis. But this is not, not everything. So besides that, we have these mobile medical ECG monitors. So a patient that may have had a heart disease in the past may be given one of these monitors to measure the ECG at home. And there's even a more mobile version of this, which can be attached to a smartphone. So this is sort of the, the pinnacle of mobile ECG measurements. So if someone is particularly paranoid about their heart's functioning, then this is something uh, they may want to use. And more common probably are these ECG-based heart rate monitors that are widely used for exercise. So this is one of the chest straps that can, be, that can be worn, for instance, during running or cycling to give accurate heart rate measurements. And while these devices typically report heart rate only, they can, generally speaking, uh, measure ECG because that's exactly how the heart rate is determined. And lastly, in terms of variable devices, there's a wristband for the Apple Watch, which has two electrodes, which then, again, allow the watch to take ECG measurements at any given time. So there's a lot of devices that use ECG, which, again, has re-sparked the discussion into using ECG as a biometric. So the generic ECG waveform is the same for all healthy individuals and looks, roughly speaking, like this. So ECG is split into individual waves, which are uh, which are given letters to identify them. But aside from this generic waveform pattern, there are individual differences, which again make ECG a viable biometric. And these largely focus around the amplitude of these individual waves and also their duration and distance from each other. So that's a very significant body of work. So if you put ECG biometrics in Google Scholar, you will get more than just a few results. And exactly this extensive amount of work has finally also resulted in one of the few commercial products, which uh, is shown on this photo here. So this is a NIMI band. This is the first, and as far as I'm aware, the only product using ECG for authentication. So the, the NIMI band is a wristband, which has two electrodes, one on the bottom of the band, which is constantly in contact with the various uh, wrist and an electrode on the buckle, which we can see on the photo here. So this is a metal electrode, and when it's touched by the user, it allows the band to measure that person's ECG. So it doesn't look like a medical monitor, but essentially does the exact same thing. Let's have a look how this NIMI band is used in practice. So with the band itself, when the band is first set up for, for first use, it calculates a biometric template of the person's ECG. So this is done by simply measuring ECG for some time, and then extracting features based on these measurements. And when this band is put on, for instance, first thing in the morning, it then verifies the user's identity by, again, taking a recording of the person's ECG for a short period of time, and then verifies the extracted features against the initially computed template. So for the developer kit, which is the version of the band we used for our research, this matching is done via the NIMI companion app, which is an app that typically runs on a user's smartphone. And once the user has authenticated to the band, the band itself can then authenticate by communicating with so-called NIMI-enabled applications, NEAs, which can essentially be any device that is capable of communicating via Bluetooth or NFC. So this could be something like 
your computer or your car or any other device that you may want to authenticate against. So in a sense, the Nimi Bandan acts as an authenticated hardware token. Uh, let me showcase two potential applications for this. So the Nimi Ban has been trialed in the past by MasterCard to support contactless payments. So in that sense, the Nimi Ban acts like a contactless debit card with the difference that it is authenticated using ECG. So it should, uh, in theory, provide uh, better security. And it's also being trialed by Halifax in the UK to authenticate users for online banking. So as we can see, this is a serious product. So let's have a look what the exact threat model is that is assumed by this device. So if we want to break this particular device, we have to first obtain access to the band itself. As with any hardware token, this is uh, generally achieved by stealing the device. However, the attacker may want to do this. The second component is that we need access to the NCA, so the Nimi Companion app, which is the app that does the actual ECG matching. However, uh, we did our research with a development kit in which this was actually true. But for the final consumer version, which has been available since last fall, this is no longer the case since the ECG matching is done on the band itself. So this requirement uh, goes away. Which leaves us with a last and final point, which is that we have to circumvent the actual ECG-based authentication. And this is the focus of our work. So let me uh, emphasize one thing, and that is that the goal of our work is not to purely break the NIMI band, but to develop a generic attack against ECG biometrics. So the attack and functioning, uh, we demonstrate that it is effective by applying it to the NIMI band, but the attack itself is universal and should, in theory, work against any ECG-based authentication system. So what we're doing is a so-called presentation attack against ECG. A presentation attack generally assumes that the attacker captures some biometric information about the victim and then presents that biometric information back to the original authentication system. So for ECG, we make use of the fact that it is actually available through a number of sources. Uh, first and foremost are printed ECG signals. So in hospitals, ECG is not usually stored in a digital manner, but it is normally printed directly to paper by the ECG monitor. So this is never available in a digital form. However, we've been able to extract the signal back from these paper printouts at a sufficiently high resolution for our research. The next component are these e-health devices, which have uh, shockingly low regard for the person's uh, privacy and store the ECG signals in an unencrypted fashion and even transmit them via email without any specific security in mind. And the last group of devices are these fitness devices, which generally only report the heart rate, but they're also devices that can collect raw ECG data, which is normally transmitted uh, wirelessly and this communication may or may not be encrypted, so this is another uh, vector through which an attacker may be able to obtain these ECG signals. There's one major challenge with all of these devices, and this is that they are all fundamentally different from the NIMI band itself. So the hardware makeup of these devices is different, the impedance of electrodes may be different, and also the location from which the signal is measured is different. So the NIMI band measures ECG basically from wrist to wrist, Whereas this fitness device, for instance, is attached to a person's chest. So in the medical domain, these are very different signals. So it is fairly likely to assume that they are also different for the purpose of authentication. And this leads us to a problem called a cross-device attack. So our goal is to use data from these different ECG sources in order to break the NIMI band. So uh, to collect data for the attack, we recruited 41 participants. And first of all, we enrolled all of them in the NIMI band. The NIMI band is um, simply the way we obtained it from the manufacturer, so this is not modified in any way. And aside from enrolling people into the NIMI band, we also managed to extract raw ECG data through the NIMI band's SDK. So that allows any NIMI-enabled application to obtain a trace of ECG data from, from the user. And aside from that, for the cross-device attacks, we use the mobile ECG monitor we can see on the left and this medical monitor on the right. And each of these provide different measurement modes, which simply reflect on where the electrodes are attached to the body, which gives us a total of five ECG signals we use for our attack. So once we have this data, this data somehow has to get back into the NIMI band. Uh, and for this, we make use of the fact that ECG is simply an electrical signal so first thing we did was um, get an 
arbitrary waveform generator, which is then attack, uh, attached to the NIMI band. This, the ECG signal is loaded into the waveform generator and then essentially played back. However, this is a fairly bulky, quite expensive, and quite noisy solution. So our second evolution of our attack was to use a laptop sound card, which then acts as a software-based waveform generator with specialized uh, software. However, this is still not quite as portable as we would like it to be. So our last approach is to encode an ECG signal as an audio file and play it back using any off-the-shelf audio player, which puts the total cost of this attack at about $20 for a cheap MP3 player and a cable you can buy for a couple of bucks on Amazon. And due to these low technological barriers, this is actually our method of choice for the remainder of this talk. So let's have a look at what claims the manufacturer may, or the developers make in their white paper. So essentially I say that there's no way to fake an ECG signal and present it to a recognition system. So this may be quite a high claim, and let me show you a bit of a proof of concept. So um, this is basically us carrying out our attack. So on the left, we can see the NIMI band, which again has not been modified in any way. And this NIMI band is connected to a smartphone, which we can see on the right, which is running a standard audio player. And this audio signal is simply um, some trace of the victim's ECG encoded as an audio file. And in the middle, we can see a smartphone running the NIMI companion app, which is the device that does the actual ECG matching. So to carry out the attack, we start the playback on the phone on the right, and then start the ECG recognition on the NIMI companion app. And this is what this looks like. So now we start ECG matching, and on the phone in the middle, we can actually see a live trace of the ECG data. And as we can see, it takes roughly two seconds for the attacker to actually be accepted as a legitimate user. As we can see, the NIMI band is not connected to a human in any sort of way which shows that signal injection generally uh, is a feasible attack. Now let's look at the results. So this plot shows basically the fraction of users that were successfully attacked using this approach. The rightmost bar shows the success rate of using data that was collected directly on the NIMI band. So this is um, the straightforward attack, which was successful in 81% of cases, which is roughly also the success rate users had to authenticate themselves. So in that sense, that is an attack that is virtually successful all the time. And the other five are the cr so-called cross-device attacks that I talked about earlier. And we can see that the success rates are quite a bit lower. And depending on the device, uh, we were not successful at all. And generally, the success rates vary quite a bit. So naturally, this is something we wanted to improve. So to do that, we first had to look into why exactly this is the case. So on this plot, we can see normalized ECG signals for the same user collected on a number of devices. So this pink line here is a waveform collected directly on a NIMI band, which follows a sort of uh, specific shape, whereas the teal line on the bottom is a waveform uh, calculated or recorded on the ECG monitor. And the most striking thing is we can see those are simply different waveforms. They have different amplitudes. The waves last for uh, different durations, which uh, leads us to believe that the biometric features would also be affected, which explains the lower uh, chance of success. So generally, different waveform morphologies is the challenge we are facing with these cross-device attacks. So what we did to further look into this was um, to recruit a number of users we didn't use for the original attack and calculate distributions for a certain number of features. So what we've shown here, what we can see here, are amplitude features and the distribution for these between two different devices. So the red bars are, uh, show the feature distribution on our target device, which in this case is this medical ECG monitor, whereas the blue data is data collected on a NIMI band. And the striking difference is that the overlap between those distributions is almost non-existing which again explains the relatively low success rate of our initial attack. So in order to fix this problem, we are training a so-called cross-device mapping. Um, for this mapping, we always have a source device, which is the device where we get the ECG data from, and a target device, which is the device we want to attack. In this case, the target device is always the NIMI band, whereas the source device varies depending on which of our uh, five source signals we use. 
And as an input for our training process, we have these feature distributions. So for each feature, we measure the distribution across a number of users. And then our goal is to find a single linear function that minimizes the differences between those feature distributions. So the important thing to note is that this is a single function that is valid for all users, which essentially brings the problem down to an optimization problem because the differences between devices may also be specific to users to a certain degree. So in the end, we, end, uh, we obtain a single function f, which the attacker only has to develop once. So in that sense, this, um, this mapping is trained on population data, and the better this mapping is, uh, the higher the success rate of any future attacks will be. So this is a process that is not specific to a user, but that is simply performed on population data. And this is what this looks like. Um, we have our initial feature distributions, which again have very little overlap. And this is the result we get after applying this mapping. So again, this is a process that's only done once. And we can see that the overlap of feature distributions increases quite significantly, which then leads us to believe that our attack would be a lot more successful after applying this mapping function. So let's see if this is actually the case. These are our final results that we obtain after applying this mapping function to our source ECG data before presenting it to the NIMI band. So we can see that, especially for the PALM and LEAD1 measurements, which are specific modes of the ECG monitor, the success rates increase by quite a, quite a good margin. So especially for the PALM measurement, we go from 0% to 24%, so this actually becomes a viable attack vector where success rates for the other measurement modes simply increase by different amounts. And this also results in the combined success rate of all cross-device attacks uh, to go to 62%. Okay, for some um, ECG data, we are less than successful, which is simply the cause of the measurement location being very different and the signal simply being a different signal. So to wrap this up, we have presented a successful presentation attack against ECG biometrics, which can make use of a wide variety of readily available sources of ECG information. Uh, the attack, when applied to the NIMI band, has very low hardware requirements and can be performed um, at a very low cost of about $20. But it is an attack that is generally applicable against any ECG-based authentication system. For future work, we would like to mainly look into whether we can use old data to carry out the attack, because maybe now people will consider ECG data to be more sensitive from a security perspective and try to secure the data. However, if old data is still valid to carry out this attack, this would be a step that comes slightly too late. And with this outlook, I would like to conclude my presentation and would be happy to take your questions. Thank you.